Uh, thank you very much to organizers. This has really been fantastic. Um, I'm going to present some work that's been, been in progress for a half decade. Um, I'll, you'll get a little bit of an idea why. Um, and it's, uh, so I'm going to be talking about a particular uh, kind of um, measurement problem in life satisfaction. And I'm going to be able to put quite a bit of structure on it. Um, but it's also maybe, maybe narrower than uh, a lot of what we've been talking about. Uh, let me just start by um, actually going back to, you know, there's a long literature on, um, on, on how detailed a scale to give people. So, um, and, and the way sometimes this is described is that in choosing, let's say, to have a four-point response scale or a seven or 11-point response scale, you're seeking a balance between the expressive capacity that you give people. So people have a wish when you pose them a question to express themselves. And if you give not enough options, not enough resolution, not enough precision in, in the answer choice, people will actually be frustrated that um, they have to choose course uh, course answers that don't let them express themselves. And uh, it's a balance between that and processing capacity, which is that you may overwhelm people with too many options. Um, and, you know, there's some history in this from the from a Likert-like scales, where you actually have to interpret language on each of the response options. And, uh, and so you can think of really simple questions that look like binary uh, questions to to Likert-like ones, which have an ordinal meaning relationship. And then now with the modern life satisfaction question, often you have some verbal anchors on the top and the bottom, maybe fully satisfied, uh, um, very satisfied, very unsatisfied, something like that at the end. But it's essentially a, this very strange quantitative response where we leave it a lot up to the imagination of the respondent to figure out what those mean. Uh, anyway, so without going into it, there are studies on, you know, what the best um, compromise is in terms of the number of options. And so for the reasons of that kind of work, there's now an international standard uh, of an 11 points scale for life satisfaction. I'm going to go very quickly over some of the history uh, of progression in Canada. Um, just by, if you can see this slide, um, sufficiently for me to point out a couple of features. So this is a progression over time of various Canadian surveys um, from the General Social Survey, but there's also some others in here, um, including the CCHS. Um, and both of those I just mentioned are ongoing. In fact, the last panel is also from, is from the Gallup World Poll Canadian component. So uh, it used to be that in Canada, we used a four point scale for the life satisfaction question. And, um, and that became five. And what happened, and then we went to 10, and then we went to 11, okay, on all these surveys. So what happened when we went from five to 10 and 11 is all of a sudden, instead of having a unimodal distribution, where you could see there's one peak here, and in Canada, it's not actually at the top, but it's one down from the top in a five-point scale. Um, oh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, what we went to is um, not one, but three peaks. So uh, you can see here that, the, uh, that there's a, an enhancement at something like uh, eight or uh, uh, you, you know, where in some, some sense the most, which is the most common answer, but then there's these secondary peaks at 10 and an enhancement at five and, this, and another peak at, uh, at, zero, at, at zero or one at the bottom of the scale. And this is actually quite reproducible. Um, so, so, you know, across um, outside of Canada, across many places that you get these enhancements at zero, five and 10. So that's gonna be the focus of what I'm going to try to understand. We have heard various accounts of the processes by which people are, the processes, cognitive processes people are going through when they encounter the life satisfaction question. Um, and 
I don't think it's at all obvious. I, and so I'm going to throw out one story about what happens when we answer this question. Um, and you'll see the key assumption that I'm making is about the last part. So when I'm faced with this question, um, you know, maybe I do something like the following. I, I figure out what is salient to a good life uh, or to, to my life satisfaction. I look for evidence and the evidence is partly from my limbic system, memory of, of uh, limbic, my limbic system, say affect, but also anything that is cognitive uh, in terms of aspirations, uh, you know, that I can appeal to. And then I have to weight and aggregate that evidence. So some things are more important than others. Some categories or domains of life are more important than others. And uh, okay, so something like this may happen. But even when I'm finished all of that mysterious uh, process, I now am faced with the answer to the question. So, so those, you know, those three steps are useful to answering the question, but then I'm also faced with a zero to 10 scale. And I now have to project my answer onto a discrete scale. And what I'm going to uh, assume here is that everybody does steps one to three in a similar way, but that the projection onto a scale might sort people into two different kinds, a subset of whom simplify the scale. So before they even come up with their answer, they are already bound to only answer 0, 5, or 10, because it's too complicated to use the full scale. Um, and this would have something to do with their, uh, you know, we've had, we've had, there may be different reasons for this, and I'm not going to focus on cultural ones right now, but uh, I'm, I'm going to propose that one of the influences on what scale they use between these two is just their familiarity or, or their comfort with numbers with math. So the, I'm more likely to be overwhelmed by all of these quantitative options if I am just have a little bit less education or a little bit less um, what I call numeracy. Okay, and so there's this two steps in within step four of this cognitive task. One is to choose between the full scale or the uh, subset of the scale, which is just the top and the bottom and the middle value. And then Using that according, using the scale, uh, I project accordingly onto either the three-point scale or the eleven-point scale. Now, I've suggested already um, what I have in mind as a possible cause or explanatory factor for how people make the choice. Let me show you some evidence of that. If I break up just the raw distribution of responses in Canada to the life satisfaction question. And I break people up just based on their education level. Um, and this is going to be for people who are above 25 years old, so that they've all had, um, in principle, they may have already had post-secondary education. Now I'm using data with the crude level of education. It only has these four categories. Uh, and the first one is, um, is uh, didn't finish high school. The next is graduated from high school. And then there's one which actually not very many people give an answer to, which is they had some post-secondary education. And then there's one that's post-secondary. And so what strikes me about these, not even thinking about the mean responses here, is that this focal value behavior, in other words, the enhancement of 0, 5, and 10 is much stronger for people at the bottom of the scale. In fact, there are more people who give a 10 um, in the no high school group than there are in the post-secondary group. Now, not that education is necessarily good for life satisfaction, although that's one of the questions that we're going to address, but um, you see hopefully here what I do is a steady progression as we increase in education in, uh, let, let me say it the other way, a steady um, decrease in the focal value response behavior as we increase education. And so here's where I'm headed. Uh, I'm going to have a kind of a two-stage model in which an unobservable, the numeracy of the respondent is modeled based on whatever we like, but the primary predictor is going to be education. And then a, um, and then in the normal way, we also model life satisfaction, but it'll be a, uh, as usual, um, another unobserved, you know, the internal life satisfaction, uh, state will, will now actually 
be an unobserved zero to 10 life satisfaction measure, but then the observed measure is either that measure precisely, or it's um, the, the zero, five or 10 answer. Okay, let me, that's actually, sorry. There's, an, there's, there's a latent variable, which is the person's well-being, and that gets projected either onto the three-point scale or the 11-point scale based on the numer person's numeracy, which is going to be dichotomous. In other words, either they are high numeracy or they're low numeracy, low numeracy, and that is going to be modeled also based on observables in particular education. Um, and I'll say right now that uh, because, I mean, you know, because education can also have a direct influence on life satisfaction, you might have, uh, you might see immediately that this, this problem is not convex. In other words, um, it might not be easy to come up with a, um, let's say to converge on a, on a solution here. So it's harder to compute than an OLS, let's say. And um, let me now just give you a little bit of intuition about, okay, so I'll, I'll tell you the objectives. Why, you know, what, what do we want to do from this? But um, one thing we're going to be able to estimate is the bias on, so the goal here is to correct for biases due to the fact that these two types of respondents are mixed together. And we'll never really, uh, without, asking people to choose their own scale, which I advocate for, we won't be able to separate them. Um, so let me show you one, um, one of the kinds of biases that we're interested in and kind of how complicated it is, right? So what happens to the average life satisfaction score? So I'm gonna show you, here's a distribution again of life satisfaction responses. And think about the people who are rounding their answer, their true answer, the true life satisfaction answer, which would be on a zero to 10 scale, say, they're rounding it down to zero or up to five or down to five or up to 10. When the distribution is relatively low, in other words, it's a population with low life satisfaction, the dominant effect of focal value behavior is going to be to round downwards towards zero. And so you'll get a negative bias on life satisfaction measured crudely, naively measured life satisfaction. As the distribution, uh, in a place where the distribution is a little bit higher, you'll have both rounding down to zero and down to up the large effects. And so you might have no bias uh, on life satisfaction. As the distribution is again higher, you will have mostly bias of rounding up to five. And then you'll have mostly rounding up to five and down to five. So the bias, so, so, sorry, so in this case, now I have a positive bias on life satisfaction. I now have a zero, possibly zero bias again on life satisfaction as I've got a sort of symmetric uh, um, focal value effects. And then again, the life satisfaction bias becomes negative as the distribution becomes even higher. And then again, it might go to zero. And then again, it becomes positive, right? So, uh, so that means even something as simple as, you know, if I think about how much this is going to bias average life satisfaction, the, there's non-monotonic uh, relationship here with the properties of the distribution. And similarly, the biases I will get on other forms of inference, in particular coefficients uh, explaining determinants of life satisfaction are going to be quite complicated in general. Let me... Um, just quickly mention a few cruder treatments that I could uh, undertake uh, in order to look at the strength of this effect and maybe even to correct for it. Um, and uh, to do that, let me just emphasize something that's probably already obvious and I even stated it yesterday, but we often think about whether or not we're happy with the cardinality assumption in analyzing life satisfaction data. And if we're not, we fall back on an ordinal, um, ordinality assumption. And this paper is all about relaxing even that. Okay, so I'll show you uh, if that's not already clear that we can have um, an increase in something like income causing a decrease in life satisfaction. Okay, so here are two uh, somewhat heuristic ideas just to, and, and this is, these, these first two are nice because you can easily do them without a lot of computation or a fancy model. 
One is, hey, instead of you know just running OLS on all the data or running an ordered logit or ordered probit on all the data, what if I just uh, look at the probability of giving each single answer? So I could just run a whole bunch of logits, one for each uh, value. Uh, that's a bit weird because they're not at all independent. Better than that is that I could look at each step. So what's the, the probability of going from zero to one based on my explanatory variables? What's the probability of going from one to two and so on? Um, and uh, so here's, here's what happens, by the way, if I, if I do the first thing. And you can see, uh, so this is the, the effect of, um, of uh, education on life status on, uh, on each particular probability of, of responding to each particular value. And you, can, you might expect to see a, at least a monotonic rise in these coefficients, right? In other words, uh, education should tend to increase the chance of higher values and decrease the chance of lower values. Um, and instead, you get these very sharp divergences here um, for 5 and 10. And if you zoom in, also quite significantly on 0. So that's one way to see the effect, and um, but it's a little bit difficult to interpret. Here is the second thing I mentioned, where I model the probability of just among all the, the respondents who gave either a zero or one, modeling the um, probability of being a one based on different predictors. And so some of the quite anomalous things you can see here, if you stare at this um, probably more than I'm going to give us time to do, you see strong reversals for, for the 5 to 6, uh, 9 to 10 um, coefficients. Uh, in particular, the education and the income ones look fishier than anything else. And just as an example of this negative effect, you can see here that the effect of a higher income um, uh, is to make it less likely to give a 10 than a 9 uh, on the life satisfaction. So that, that's an example of a of a negative of, of a um, of a non ordinal relationship in in, um, in the life satisfaction scale. Okay, so not belaboring that. Um, I could also do something else, a multinomial logit. So here is where I tr I uh, model the probability of each particular response, but properly taking into account the fact that only one of them is given. This, of course, clearly violates an IIA assumption, but, um, uh, but it's also maybe interesting to look at. And I'm just mentioning all of those because they're things that you can you know, run very quickly, easily on your data. I'm going to do something, as I mentioned already, uh, a little bit more involved. OK, so um, here are the objectives of having this, what I call cognitive model, where we model the scale that's been used by the respondent and model the uh, answer they would are trying to express of life satisfaction. And so objectives, I want to be able to correct for average life satisfaction. Thanks, Casper. Uh, so the model, uh, the, 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 mean, the bias, mean bias to life satisfaction. I want to be able to estimate the bias to marginal effects. And I'm defining an index to measure the strength of this problem. And that's essentially just going to be the fraction of people who uh, seem to be um, low numeracy type. OK, and um, I'm going to show you in, uh, estimates on real data only briefly at the very end. Um, because the first thing to do with a new model like this, actually, I think, is to estimate it on synthetic data, where you're fully in control of the data generating process, and you can make sure that you understand what's going on. So I just want to show you that, uh, that these estimates are able to correctly uh, identify uh, and control for, for this bias, for the focal value effect. Um, one more thing I haven't really said is that if you look at the literature on the effects of education on life satisfaction, we often get a negative effect here. Here are several papers where it looks like more education makes people less happy. And this has been you know, controlling after controlling for income. This has been a bit disconcerting. You could call it a bit of a, a bit of a paradox. And so one, one other goal for a model like this would be actually be to reverse that finding and make have a more sensible as um, estimate for the education effect on life satisfaction. Okay, so I've already 
verbally described this model, and I'm not really going to belabor the math here, but uh, I'll state it one more time. I'm modeling, it's a mixture model. So there are two kinds of people out there, high numeracy ones who are going to use the full scale, low numeracy ones who are going to use just a three point scale. And, um, and the observed answer on the 11 point scale is going to be a mixture of the two kinds of respondents. Um, and you can think about, so basically the, the model of, um, of numeracy is, is a logit. And then the model of each kind of the high numeracies, uh, 11 point response is an ordered logit. And the model of the low numeracy response is like a three uh, point logit, ordered logit. Uh, and so these are all combined together. And now I'm just going to apply this model to some simulated data. And to keep things very simple, I'm going to assume that people just have two characteristics determining their life satisfaction. One is their education level, and the other is some kind, something like income. And uh, the numeracy is, is, is related just to the education level. The um, income is also correlated with education, but has other determinants as well. And together, uh, those things determine people's, uh, uh, sorry, the latent well being is determined jointly by the um, education level and income. Okay, and I could have other predictions in there, but this is actually general in the sense that uh, there's something determining well being which is correlated with, um, which is only partly correlated with, with, uh, with education and there's education itself. So uh, I have the possibility here of confusion between things that are causing numeracy and things that are causing uh, causing life satisfaction because um, education is in both of them. Okay. Um, so that philosophy aside, there's a lot of computation here. After some quite some years, I'm finally able to have a convergent model. Um, and so this is using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo techniques. And let me just show you now what, uh, just to prove that this thing is kind of working. Uh, every panel, the first panel here at the top left is different from all the others in that this is showing the distribution of, um, of life satisfaction. There's a histogram of life satisfaction responses. The blue ones are the high types and the, this other pinkish color is are the low type contribution. Remember, these are synthetic data. So this is the actual true uh, data set looks like this. And all, in all of the other panels on this plot, the horizontal axis is showing a variation in the, um, essentially in the fraction that of the population who are low type or the fraction who are high type. So as we go to the right, we have a population with more education or actually just higher determination, higher influence of education on um, on this numeracy parameter. And so these are mostly showing biases. So on the top right, uh, you're looking at the mean bias to life satisfaction. And so you can see when on the, on the left, when, um, when the fraction of high type, high numeracy population is low, we get a bias of, of 0.2 uh, life satisfaction. And as the fraction of, of uh, high type, of numerate types increases, that goes towards zero. Now the next panel, the education uh, effect as measured by a naive order logit, so the kind of thing that uh, maybe some of us have been doing for years, shows that for, you know, on the left side of this, for um, cases where there are lots of these focal value behavior, we get a bias uh, by a factor of minus one, and this is scaled, that means that the entire education effect is being mismeasured. Instead, we get something negative when it should be positive. Um, on to the right of that is the income effect from a naive, naive estimate. And we find that we are uh, uh, biasing downwards by about 30% in, you know, with these parameters. Okay, the third row shows the estimates, not from a naive order logit, but from, from my uh, mixture model. And basically the green ones, which are the, the mixture models show that uh, there is no bias left. So we probably corrected for it. 
And if I just constrain the model to have um, all high types, then I miss, then I get the blue ones, which are actually just the same as the order logic. Okay, uh, I'll just show you one more of these, which, um, which now it's the same, except the horizontal axis here is varying the essentially the average life satisfaction. So it's move, moving that distribution at the top left from left to right, saying, you know, where, where is this centered around? And so the, um, the second row left panel shows this relationship I told you about at the beginning where the bias on, um, sorry, the, actually the top right panel shows you what I showed you at the beginning, which is that the sign of the bias on life satisfaction even changes um, from negative to positive, uh, positive to negative and back to positive again. And now in the second row, you can see that it's just as complicated for for the effect on inference about uh, marginal effects of education and income. So the education effect, uh, without going into the uh, details, uh, I'm just showing you it's complicated, but we can explain why. It also starts out very large and negative and actually becomes positive, okay? So, um, so you can have an overestimate just like you can have an underestimate of the education effect. Chris, um, and, it's, yeah. two to, it's two to four. So if you could slowly move or to a conclusion, that'd be great. Yep. Um, okay, so I've summarized the, the um, synthetic estimates and I'm just gonna show you one slide of, of actual empirical estimates. Um, right, so the bias to life satisfaction can be positive or negative. Um, as I mentioned, based on, based on basic principles, it also has these zeros. And the bias to education can uh, also be positive or negative and large. Um, and indeed on income, it's negative and large. Okay, so I carry out a, again an almost as an as simple model um, using Canadian data from there. Uh, so I'm just modeling life satisfaction here as a function to, to be affected by education and income. And um, and I model the numeracy to be just determined by education. Okay, and so this is the last data slide. Uh, and the first two columns show what I call naive estimates. So here's what I get if I run an OLS. I find a negative effect of education on life satisfaction of minus 0.03. And I find a 0.42 um, coefficient of uh, log income on life satisfaction. I get, of course, the same thing if I do order logit. Turns out the Unlike order probit, I don't even need to talk about marginal effects. These raw coefficients tend to look like OLS coefficients. Um, and then the right two columns are my mixture model, where the left one is constrained to be look just like an order logit. It reproduces that perfectly. And the right one is where I allow this uh, numeracy, this focal value behavior. And what happens is I get a marked increase in the importance of income for life satisfaction. I reverse the sign on the negative education effect on life satisfaction. Um, and I find that a lot of that, I can explain a lot of, uh, you know, strongly explain the numeracy effect based, a focal value behavior based on, um, on education. Okay, so I have more sophisticated, slightly um, richer models than that uh, now, but not to present. Um, and uh, let me just summarize by uh, saying this gets more complicated if I think about panel data. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of past work where I think this kind of this this focal value behavior has been very prominent in the data, and it needs they need to be reexamined. And then, um, if you look at focal value behavior across countries and across different cultures, it gets a bit more complicated than this. And so uh, there's lots of work to do on on that front. And um, let me. Just without going through all these conclusions, I'll leave this up for a moment. moment. But you know, I think this is one of the first really, uh, you know, quantitative corrections of something that um, I, I, th I, th I think this is a this this idea that education is a reasonable determinant of this behavior uh, is at least a good start, and it's really quite successful at um, at correcting one of these anomalies, and it, it has significant implications for some of the key key effects that we are used to estimating in the literature. Okay, thanks.